By no means am I a traditional healer or an expert in traditional healthcare practice. And um, I think that I actually feel this is one of the most difficult talks I've ever had to do. And um, I've agreed to do it just because I feel that I've been very fortunate to be exposed and to actually have to read a lot and interact with people on a number of occasions about these issues and also to interact with traditional healers through our medical student training program in School of Public Health up in Bushburg Ridge and therefore felt that, well, perhaps I can actually help in terms of highlighting some of the issues that um, I feel are important for this discussion. And as Dave said, it's been, it was a very interesting experience actually working on that book chapter around the use of traditional medicines and their interaction with HIV and how then that affects nutrition and um, you know, management of HIV patients, how do we handle it, et cetera, et cetera. And the issues that came out of that uh, also I'm going to use for this discussion. But there's also other research projects that we have done, a number of projects um, that I'm going to be drawing from. Uh, one of them is qualitative interviews with nurses who are providing HIV care in four different facilities in Mpumalanga. Another one is a longitudinal qualitative study of patients, and we also interviewed them about traditional healers, etc., and their practices. And uh, another one is a, it's a big project. It's a five-year project called Researching Equity and Access to Healthcare in four different provinces. Um, Mpumalanga, Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal, and Western Cape. So I'm going to be drawing from all of those different sources to try and make sense of, of this issue and actually highlight the issues. I have to tell you, we cannot exhaust this topic. And it's possible that Dave might actually have to stop me so that we can sort of engage in some discussions, very likely. But I'm hoping that by that time I would have shared with you some of what I think are critical issues. Okay. So I'd like to start with this statement. I came across this statement when I was doing my MMAT for film medicine, and my topic was actually around how was actually motivated by herbal intoxication that we encountered in the children's ward at St. Richard's Hospital where I was working at the time. And uh, we, I decided to actually interview caregivers and mothers about their reasons for giving children traditional medicines. So, as I was doing my readings, writing my thesis, I came across this article, a very good article written by Alan D. Wolf, and this statement struck me. And at, the, at first lens, I thought it was a simple statement. But then when I went back to it, I, it really, really struck me. Does it strike you the same way? No? It's just another statement? The difference between acknowledging and endorsing something. I mean, English is not my first language, but I think that I, I really appreciate this statement. And it's going to make sense to you as we go along. OK, why is it the right time now to actually acknowledge the role of traditional healers? I mean, there's a lot of other issues that are going on around HIV, et cetera, et cetera issues around health reform. But why is it the right time now? I mean, it's always been the right time, perhaps, for other people. For some of us, we've gone through a life-transforming journey that was very difficult to come to the point where we actually have to acknowledge the role of traditional healers. But I think I just want to highlight the fact that, especially in rural areas, the problem of human resource shortages is big. And not just because there's shortage in facilities, but relative to the demand for care, it actually gets worse. And I think if you have been there and felt the pressure of actually trying to deliver care the best way you can and still feel like it's just a drop in the ocean, it's really frustrating. And yet you are aware that there are so many other resources around you that you could tap into. But unfortunately, 
there are so many issues that make it complex for you to actually engage those people. And you know how influential they are. And in my mind right now, I'm not talking about traditional healers. I'm thinking about community health workers, for instance. But same principles can be applied to traditional healers. I think the fact that there's so much enthusiasm right now around health system strengthening and transformation, it will be a good time to actually begin to bring these issues up for discussion. And we need to do, the, to do it in such a way that, they can, that all the other changes that are going on can actually create a context for them to actually be located. In 2008, I want to mention, you already know about the Traditional Healers Act, but it was not actually changing anything. It was there to recognize traditional healers. But in 2008, the Department of Health released a traditional healers healthcare practice draft, policy draft, to actually incorporate or integrate traditional healers in the formal healthcare system. Now, that policy document makes it very clear that they're not trying to actually combine, but they actually want to recognize it as a system of healthcare. I don't know what happened to it since I last saw the draft, but it exists it's somewhere. I've read it several times. If you want a copy, you can get it. Now, just terminology here. Universal coverage, we all know what that is. But universal health coverage is also another international movement that's currently going on. And it's also supported by a lot of um, international organizations. But locally as well, our governments are under pressure to actually ensure universal health coverage, which basically means that everyone has to get essential health care. And it's measured through the principles of equity and risk protection, just so that people don't suffer excessive costs. But all of these things, including the national health debate, insurance debate at the moment, and all the committees that some of you may be sitting in to try and bring it to pass and actually into action are all creating a great context for us to get into these debates. Okay, let me move on. Now, when we think about the role of traditional healers, what are the things that come to mind? Obviously, problems. We're thinking toxicity and poisoning of medicine. I mean, this was my motivation to actually pursue this debate around traditional healers. I got into it because of herbal intoxication in children. When you're sitting and faced with a child with herbal intoxication, not knowing what to do, no, not knowing very well there's no antidote, you're thinking, why would anyone want to give these things to a child? And it's only when you actually get into it that you begin to actually understand certain things that you may not understand. And I know I'm black and African, but there's a lot I didn't know until I got into it. Okay. Now, the other thing is a lot of people feel that there's a lot of people who are just out there claiming to be traditional healers, exploiting people, etc., etc. And all these things are valid concerns. Traditional healers are concerned that we as formal health care practitioners disrespect what they do and their work and their context, etc. And of course we do for our own different reasons. Now, at the same time, they're very concerned about protection of the indigenous knowledge. On top of that, they feel that despite their attempts to actually engage traditional healers, there has not been a response from our side to them. All of these things form part of the long-standing tensions that exist between the traditional healthcare practices and formal healthcare practice, so modern medicine, whatever you want to call it, allopathic, etc. OK, so for me to stand here today, there's just a few things I want to highlight. And I'm going to say these things to set the scene, and then I'm going to go into other discussions around practical issues. But in terms of just setting the scene, I'm going to address these things very quickly, hopefully. But the question is, so we've gone past the question of whether we should include them or not. Right? Whether we should work with them or not. Have we gone through that, past that question? Or that's where we have to start? I'm not sure. I'm going to assume that we all agree that we are in a crisis situation, and we need to tap into any resource that we can tap into. And with that assumption, I'm going to proceed and say, 
What will it take to include traditional healers in the fight against HIV? Recognizing their existence and their functions would be really helpful, and I'll unpack that a little bit. Reconciling these long-standing differences that I mentioned, or tensions, will also be helpful. And of course, identifying possible specific roles, but then doing this in such a way that is non-patronizing to their existence and functions. And also providing opportunities and incentives that are not going to cause divides amongst them or problems. Now the question will always be, how do you then regulate that whole process? From what angle? From what perspective? And that's a difficult question as well. If you look at this slide, it's got African this, African traditional this, African traditional this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The one point that I really want to make with this slide, the one point I want to make with this slide is the association of African traditional health practices with the African identity or African cultural identity. I mean, this was a revelation when I was doing my MAD back then, but actually, I've learned to actually appreciate it a lot more. It's almost as if these people, these traditional healers, are also leaders, are figures of authority. They're respected and they embody the African culture in, in, a, certain, in a way that other people don't. And you don't only find this in the African culture as well. You also find it in, in other cultures where you've got people who are figures that actually embody the, the existence of that group. I mean, you go to Muslim, you go to Chinese, you go to other groups, you also find that there is that sort of system that exists. And that makes it really difficult to actually directly confront the issue of traditional healthcare medicine. And this is why I would prefer that we separate issues. One of the things that came out in the discussions that we had on the book chatter with Dave and Bernard Gade, it was exactly that. How do you only focus on the problems around ingestion of traditional medicine? And forget the rest of the things, forget the rest of you know, traditional healing aspects, forget the rest of non-ingested traditional medicines, forget the rest of the issues. How do you only focus on that? and be able to confront the issues and, 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 and not come across as if you're pointing a finger or you're just dismissing things without understanding them. Because people are saying that the reason we are not able to collaborate with traditional healers is because we don't understand what they do and they don't necessarily understand what we do. Now we need to take the time to actually unpack these things and begin to understand them. And they are complex. So, with this slide, I'm trying to separate, therefore, the issues around African traditional medicines, the healing aspect of it, which is different from ingesting traditional medicines. And also, this issue of the influence and authority that traditional healers have and embody in a, in a community. And you see this coming out very strongly in rural areas. And also, I think, we also have to actually think about what it represents in terms of people who are subscribing to it and using it. Because when you raise these issues, people get completely defensive. They get really, really defensive. And now, we keep asking why is that the case? But then you also have to see, understand what it, what it represents and how they understand it. Because it's not the same way that we may understand it. Okay, in terms of ensuring that knowledge is passed from one generation to the next, these are the people who apparently, so they say, have the ability to do that more than everyone else because they, they are investing their whole lives in concentrating on the cultures and traditions of the African culture, etc., and practices. Anyway, let's proceed, but I wanted to flag those issues, reconciling the differences. 
Now, this is one of the most sensitive slides. And, and I, I'm going to try and say things and proceed with caution so that people don't misunderstand me. But I think that let's confront these issues. Let's face them. Okay, So the perception that comes from the people in the community, the suspicion, the distrust that exists have to do with the fact that people keep asking, where does this Western practice come from? It's not our culture. It doesn't come from here. Others are arguing that, well, it's been here for many years. It's become part of the culture. But then the issue is, every single person you interact with, they see things differently in their own ways, and they interpret it differently in their own ways. When you look in the literature as well, you find the same things, actually. You read literature from anthropology, it presents a different picture. You read literature from sociology, it presents a different picture as well. I mean, in sociology, you get a lot of bow medicine criti critique in terms of how you know, it's not holistic, etc., etc., etc. In anthropology, you get a lot of um, recognizing the medical systems in different contexts and bringing different life worlds together, etc., etc. And I think that these tensions, we have to find a way of reconciling them. And it's got to do with the fact that we also have, each one of us have our own biases in terms of our culture, where we're coming from, etc. I mean, I don't want to sound like a psychotherapist right now, but I think we have to actually look at issues in terms of what is it that we understand by traditional practice and scientific medicine, and how do we separate it from issues of spirituality, Christianity, and other forms of supernatural powers and existence and performance and engagement, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that people interact with. These are all very sensitive issues. And I think that these issues create a barrier in terms of us proceeding with discussions around how to engage traditional healers in HIV care. They have to be confronted, and we have to reach some kind of a consensus or understanding of some sort. Now, traditional healers also have, traditional healers have been associated with witchcraft, etc., etc., and they've been called witch doctors, etc. And those things still exist. People who, have, who are progressive and have gone past those stages, they think that those are not issues anymore. But actually, even now when we do research studies, you still find people referring to traditional healers as witch doctors. Even within the rural community, where you know, there are people who are Christians and others who feel that you know, they, are, they follow African traditional cultures, etc., there are tensions among them. And they're also pointing fingers at each other. And they're using these kind of words and definitions that have been used before as reasons to perpetuate all these tensions. Now, a lot of the times we think of African traditional medicines in terms of traditional healers, African traditional healers. But if you look at the Traditional Healers Act, it includes faith healers in there. And faith healers are not necessarily of the African traditional practice as such. And I say that with caution because if you go to churches like the Zionist Church, if you look at their practices, they are using a, a Christian paradigm, but at the same time, they are practices that are very, very similar to what African traditional practitioners actually do. They may use different products and not so much the herbal medicines, not so much the animal products that African traditional healers can actually use. But the Zionist church is very intriguing. It's very interesting for me because for some reason they've been able to reconcile Christianity with African traditional practices somehow. And I'm not sure if it's in equilibrium, it, but from where I stand, from what I hear, it just looked very interesting to me. But basically, on this side, I'm hoping that I'm actually capturing the spectrum 
of the different fields that HIV actually caters for or that you expect with HIV care. From basic science, clinical science to prevention, social welfare, health systems issues, policy advocacy, and rights, human rights. On the other side, sort of more practical issues in terms of what happens in a, in a HIV program. And I'm also hoping that the list is complete. Knowledge and information, risk behavior, testing and counseling, care and support, ART uptake, and maintenance. If it's complete then, it looks to me that traditional healers can actually participate in any of those things in one way or another. We've worked a lot with these initiatives to try and get nurses to engage in HIV care. And I remember when we started, people were saying there's no way nurses can do it. We're working a lot now with engaging community health workers. And the same reactions we are getting that what, what, what are they going to do? They're lay workers. But actually, I think that we are going to make a lot of progress with traditional healers. And I'm looking forward to that day. Is it possible that we can be able to reach a point of mutual respect, trust, and transparency between ourselves and traditional healers? If it's not, then we shouldn't even bother. Because these are things they value. These are the things they value. In terms of principles of engaging traditional healers, they want that mutual respect, the trust, and they want the transparency. Now, if we go into engaging the dialogue as well, they don't want to feel that they're being manipulated. They don't want to be puppy dogs for the health system. Because they feel that independently, they have a system that works and has been working and they've been part of and it's been passed from their um, great, great, great fathers and going through generations. And in a way, they want that sort of recognition as independence and capable on their own right. In terms of scope, as I mentioned, they can do education, they can do testing. I mean, if last year, as we all know, lay councillors are now allowed to prick. And I, I mean, I know there, there are issues around what happens if they injure themselves and what protections do they have, etc. But if lay councillors can prick patients, why can't traditional healers? I mean, they cut a whole lot of big gaps in bodies, etc. Why can't they prick? I mean, they should. Mobilization for uptake of treatment, the biggest problem we have is coverage of ART. And we want to close that gap. And they have the authority in these areas to encourage patients to actually move into care and take up care. And not just that, at the moment there's a general feeling that there are actually barriers to actually, for people to actually take up treatment. If family members can do adherence support, etc., I mean, they can do it. In terms of tracing patients, we're using lay workers to do all of these things. And of course, this is important because another hot topic besides coverage and uptake is retention at the moment of patients in care. That attrition is high, loss to follow up, is, loss to follow up rates are really high. And those are serious issues that we are dealing with at a health systems level, but programs are struggling with it. I mean, initially we thought that treatment adherence was going to be a problem, but actually, treatment adherence is very high in ART programs. R adherence rates that are being reported in programs are really, really high. And a, a review by Mills et al. shows that in, in 2006 shows that Africans are actually having higher adherence rates than people in the Western countries as well. So adherence rates to treatment are really good. Now, 
The next issue I want to address is the issue of what happens then to their autonomy when it comes to monitoring. If we do involve them, how do we monitor them? How do we monitor what they do? Are they going to do it themselves? Do we want to do it? Is someone in government having to do it? How do we go about monitoring their practice, especially if they want that autonomy and space to their own, to themselves? Reporting. I mean, I hope there's no one from PEPFA here, but PEPFA indicators are really hard and reporting. But if we have to do it, how are we going to go about doing it? Do we expect them to be literate, to count, etc.? How do we make sure that whatever payments that we implement in terms of whatever involvement in programs, be it VCT or HCT, et cetera. If there's some kind of funding to a program, how do you make sure that the payment is not inequitable? One of the things that we're struggling with at the moment, it's if you look at NGOs for community health workers, some organizations are funded, others are not. They're all doing the same things in the community. And there's so much tension around it. Aren't we creating that ourselves? And you will be hearing, I'm sure, at the South African East Conference, these issues come up as well in terms of the tensions around it and what it, the impact it has on the quality of care. Now, can we learn from these lessons? Can we draw from these lessons to then say that let's be careful in terms of how we proceed in the future? Just related to that, I want to highlight the issue of the fact that there are different organizations that traditional healers affiliate themselves with so that they get registered, et cetera. And we already know that there are tensions between those organizations. And some people are saying that things are happening, but they're only happening in association with THO, and THO doesn't actually represent all the traditional healers. Because then, if we're going to do dialogues, we need to be aware of these issues and be able to make sure that there's good representation in discussions with them. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there's people who are out there claiming to be traditional healers. There was a study that was done in Gauteng that showed at the time about 80,000 traditional healers were available and working in Gauteng, but only 10% of those were considered genuine traditional healers, only 10%. How do we then make sure that traditional healers are trained properly within their own system and accredited properly and therefore genuine? How do we make sure of that? In terms of integration, do we want to have a doctor and a traditional healer side by side when we are treating patients? or do we want to have parallel systems? According to that draft, as I said, it, says it supports parallel systems. From what I learned, I think that parallel systems may work better, but it's possible that if people are able to work together in the same environment, that might work. Except when we did the study in 2008, interviewing mothers who were providing traditional medicines, one of the questions we asked was that, do you think that traditional healers should come and practice in the hospital so that you don't actually have to hide these medicines? Because some of them will bring medicines into, into the hospital, but hide them, continue to give children in the ward. So we were asking, do you think that you should just have traditional healers here? And they said no, some of them. They said that it's not right for people to bring medicines into the hospital. But it's not for the reason that you think. You're thinking it's not right for your own reasons, and that's what I thought. But when I actually asked, why is it not right? They said, no. If medicines are actually, a concoction is made for somebody, it's specifically for that person. If you then take it into the hospital where there are other sick children, it's going to actually cause problems for the other children in the ward. Now, for me, that was eye-opening. Because I then said, okay, so 
what, sh should we have traditional healers coming in then? They said, no, if traditional healers are coming to practice here, it's not right because then whatever they do may help one child, but then it may actually cause problems for another. Because these things are being interpreted at a spiritual level for these people. And it, it's it was beyond my understanding at the time, but actually, for them, it makes complete sense. So I think that beginning to appreciate that, I then thought, well, I think there's a reason why, community, why traditional healers are actually not institutionalized. They practice in their own homes, in their own little round doubles. There's a special process when they're supposed to consult with somebody. They have to go into a trance. There's a process that they follow. There's a sheet that the traditional healer has. There's a, a protected environment that they actually go into. And patients can come in during the day, at night, any time. So this arrangement, this decentralized home-based environment and practice of traditional healers in itself is very interesting to me. Now, there's been a number of initiatives. Uh, in South Africa, we know very, very well about what the South African MRC is actually doing in terms of testing different um, mixtures of traditional medicines to see whether they have effectiveness on controlling HIV, etc. But there's a, quite a number of initiatives in Botswana, Uganda, Kenya, Senegal, and other areas, and also in Asian countries as well. Now, all these initiatives are supposed to be done in collaboration with traditional healers. And we are already drawing lessons from these initiatives to try and do research together that we can actually use for practice in terms of trying to work with them for patient care. And these issues that I'm raising are also emerging from these initiatives as well. Issues of tensions. But beyond that, there's also issues of ownership. What happens if traditional medicines are shown to work? Issues of patents. I mean, Dave will remember that last year when we had the HIV and traditional medicine conference in Durban, this was a hot topic that was actually discussed. Because, like I said, the indigenous knowledge protection then requires that the issues of royalties and intellectual property rights and patents be handled sensitively. There's a big concern that People would come in from wherever, do research with them. When the drugs are working, take them somewhere else and go and make money. And then they get nothing. Stealing traditional indigenous knowledge. Now, in terms of addressing these issues, what perspective are we going to take? From where I stand, if as, a, as an HIV care provider, what I would do, what I would want to do, is just for them to actually do what I want them to do. You know, if they can just educate people, provide messages, do testing in the least complicated way possible, refer patients to me, that would be great. But that's from my perspective. There are different perspectives. There's a perspective of the traditional healers themselves. And their perspective may not actually be in agreement with my perspective. What do I do then? There's a perspective of policymakers, politicians. I mean, this is a hard political issue. And as I said, that it's got to do a lot with the whole African culture and identity. Then it makes it very difficult and complicated as well. I mean, you've heard about African Renaissance and all the initiatives to try and protect the indigenous knowledge, etc. There's also a perspective of the community members. And remember when I say community, I separate them from the users on papers because community is made up of people who are pro and who are anti-traditional practices as well. How do you reconcile the two? There's a perspective of users as well, the people who actually use these medicines. And remember that people today, a person today will tell you, I don't subscribe to traditional medicines. I've never used traditional medicines. First of all, they may not be telling you the truth. And we know there's enough data and published data that tells us that in, in consulting rooms, people don't disclose use of traditional healers, use of traditional medicines, use of complementary and alternative products. In Africa, 
in the West, in UK, in the US, everywhere, they don't. Despite the fact that even complementary and alternative uh, medical products, their use is usually has increased a lot in the US and in the UK. Despite that, they still don't disclose. And the reason is, I don't want to be shot at it. So, on top of that, a person who's going to say, I don't use traditional healers today, tomorrow, they may, something may happen to them and they may be told that they're bewitched and their family may take them there, even if they personally don't subscribe. It's there, we have it in our data. Clearly, people with HIV, they are taking traditional healers against their own concern. And they, when you ask them, they will tell you that they don't subscribe. But they go to traditional healers and use them. So it's not a simple issue of separating people into users and non-users. In 2008, this was very difficult for me to admit. And for that reason, I came up with a conceptual framework to actually study the use of healthcare systems. Simple question. How do users with HIV navigate the health system? What is a health system to them? And how do they use it? Now, you're wondering what's going on here, right? Clearly, there's a big question mark there, right? That stands out. But on top of it, there's an HIV clinic, and that's where I, I see it. Okay? On the other side, on the left, there are all these health outcomes that you'll see. On this side, there are all these different forms of health care. This is a church, but it represents faith healers. And this is a social setting that these people are in. Now, all these lines that you see represent the confusion that I have based on what's in the literature, based on our experiences. We're asking the question, what actually, what, what is happening in rural South Africa? We're not sure. Here is the results. This is what we found. You think I'm kidding, right? This is really what we found. OK, these sectors basically means what happens. I need to emphasize that this doesn't mean that there's no household care. It's only because whatever care that happened in the home, we tried as much as possible to allocate to a provider the source of the medicine that they were using. And that's why it's like that. In a different study, you will see that household care is actually, self-care is actually a lot when you specifically ask that question. But basically, that's, that was the movement of patients. They will start with one provider. Some of them will stay in it, but then a lot, others will move. It's clear a lot of people in rural South Africa still use the public health care system. It's their first point of care, and most of them actually remain in it. But they tend to leave as well, and I'll, I'll explain. Now, the reason we had that maze puzzle is because if you actually map out different pathways for different people, you end up with a maze puzzle. But for each participant, you can actually retrospectively track it in terms of where they came from and the different pathways that they followed. And this is the pathway of Mabuti over a period of about four to five years, studying when he had, in 2001, he had his symptoms. And when he developed those symptoms, we could retrospectively suggest that that's where his AIDS symptoms started. He went to the local clinic. Uh, he didn't get help, local hospital. And then he went to the local clinic. He was offered an HIV test, and he refused. OK? After refusing, where did he go? To a traditional healer. And he stayed there for a while. Diagnosis was witchcraft. It didn't help. He went to a prophet. Paid 50 bucks, and by the way, Mabuti is not employed. 50 bucks is a lot of money for him. It didn't work. Then he went to a chemist, bought some bitter medicine that didn't help him. He went to another prophet, and he also paid. Didn't help. And then he went to a, another hospital, not the same one that he went to before. And then he was referred to the HIV clinic. He's really sick by then. An HIV test was done, he was diagnosed, he was initiated on treatment. Fortunately, treatment was available in 2004. It took him four years to get to the testing. I'll leave the issue of treatment aside. 
But even for patients who were tested during the antiretroviral era, we could find long delays before they get to the treatment because of their complex pathways. In a different study that was done in four provinces, and the total, total number of participants here was 1,266. And these people are using ART. Minimum criteria for inclusion was two weeks on ART. It shows that pluralism was about 34%. And we separated what we call provider pluralism and self-care pluralism. And provider pluralism is people who, in the last four weeks of their clinic visit, of the ART clinic visit, had gone to see another provider. And I'll show you the different providers that we have. And it's not just traditional healers. And the self-care pluralism was basically people who were asked, in the last four weeks, have you used money to buy any other product for healthcare purposes? And they answered yes. And they told us how much they spent, et cetera. So these are the different providers that they went to. We want to see whether they've been to the TB clinic and to the antenatal clinic. They've been to the private chemist, private doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the traditional healers. We're separating urban with rural. Obviously, traditional healers are being used a lot more in the rural area. Now, in going further on the analysis, we removed TB clinic and antenatal care clinic because we felt that people who are using those services is specific is a clear indication. We then, everyone else we included either as a plural provider, self-care provider, or plural. And we looked at their socioeconomic status. We used multiple correspondence analysis to look at their socioeconomic status, and we wanted to see what their distribution is. Obviously, here, if you look, the rural people, most rural people who are doing plural health care are poor. But in the urban areas, most people who are doing plural health care are richer. And they also see do pro, a lot of pro, plural provider, and the rural people tend to do self-care a lot more which makes sense in terms of distribution of providers. If you look at the cost, the payment for, tr for traditional healers was higher than all the other costs. But the private doctors and self-care practices, self-care which is commonly in, tr in rural areas, they were also very high. Primary health care cost almost nothing. What did we find? That negative experiences in the ART clinic were pushing people away to actually go and engage in self-care and plural provider, use of multiple providers. Negative experience will be people who answered disrespect by staff, lack of privacy, et cetera. But not only that, we also looked at what effect could plural provider usage have on these patients. And we found that it's forcing them to borrow money to go and source out all this additional health care that they need on top of their regular care in the ART clinic. But to also, on top of that, they ended up paying a whole lot of money. And what we say, what we mean by catastrophic expenditure is, if you took the total health care expenditure this person incurs in a month and compares it to the total household income, it was more than 15%, and we call that catastrophic. Now, what does this imply? According to the plan of the health reform in the country, this is what we want to move to, strengthening primary health care, revitalization, re-engineering of primary health care. We're going to change the, direction, the, the triangle from an inverted pyramid to this kind of a pyramid. But for us, that's what primary health care means. And I'm wondering whether this is the same thing that government means by primary health care. It's complex. There are no errors in there, because what we are assuming is we don't know how these things are actually related at this point. The easy way out would just be to ignore the issue. We can just sit and ignore it completely, isn't it? But the difficult thing to do is to close the sociocultural gap so that we can begin to make it possible. And that is difficult. And I'm going to run quickly, Dave, with the permission in terms of why I think that. Running an ART clinic is not easy. And I put that picture there because I want to emphasize the fact that 
In Oxford, when you look at ART Jericho, it's not the same ART that we actually think about. It represents a different reality. That's art in Jericho, okay? But it, it represents a different reality. And this is actually what happens. This is what we see between providers and patients. And this is what I feel as well when I interact with patients. We teach our nurses to discourage traditional medicines in the clinic, okay? And they use all sorts of things, scare tactics, persuasion, advice, negotiation. And when all of those things don't work, they start to think about collaborating. But what's interesting is our nurses respond differently. They d respond with cultural sensitivity. They sh indicate respect, sympathy. And when all doesn't work, look at the last, the last point there. We don't want to lose them, so we teach them what we have to teach them and then turn a blind eye. That's what they say. Now, all sorts of things will happen, and this is really a simplistic picture of what will happen. What happens when you confront and what happens when you acknowledge? But at the end of the day, what strikes me is that this data tells us that compromises come when you actually centralize the patient. When you take yourself out and you take everything else out and put the patient in the middle of the whole thing, what do you do for the sake of the patient and what's best for the patient? In conclusion, therefore, I'm saying, let's serve the best interest of that patient who is central to the whole thing. You, traditional healers, faith healers, and everybody else, we all assuming, I think, trying to serve the person who is complaining of health problems and presenting with ill health. And we can do that by trying to reconcile our different life worlds. And once again, try to separate issues and focus on specific issues that we need to be addressing and not conflate them and therefore cause misunderstandings and confusions. And promote non-judgmental communications with patients and also with traditional healers. But most of all, just be selfless and just begin to initiate dialogue and based on mutual respect. But that will mean that we have to move out of comfort zone and begin to integrate ourselves with these people who we don't necessarily agree with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.